The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Yeah. And uh, currently, if you're following a lot of blogs, a lot of people are doing a lot of work on Kinect, and you know they're making uh, quadcopters and devices that interact with the environment. And most of the work that I've seen on computer vision rega regarding recognizing your face or your gesture or uh, detecting sign languages, so they do mostly on you know your computer or standalone system. So what happens is that if you have this kind of system, if I have a system that detects your hand or your gestures, if I do number one, it should you know, open up a door. If I do number two, then it should uh, you know, turn on the engine or something like that. Now, the problem is that they'll have a standalone system that you cannot take it to other environment. It's very uh, restricted to one environment. You cannot take it to different rooms or different places. So what I want to show in my talk is that there are a lot of devices right now that are powerful enough, and if you see the upcoming new smartphones or gadgets, all of them are coming with faster processors, more RAM. So day by day, the size of the devices is getting smaller. At the same time, the performance is increasing. So doing your computation work or your project on a platform like this is a wise choice. So for now, I'll tell you the topics that I'm going to cover in the talk. So I'll give an overview of the Panda board. Then uh, there are a couple of accessories that you will need to buy before you can start developing on the Panda board. Then I will uh, show you how to install Ubuntu 12.04 LTS on the Panda board. Then there are a couple of hacks you can do to increase your performance further on the Panda board. Then uh, what is the OpenCV library? Then how you will install the latest version of OpenCV on Panda board. Then I'll show you a few live demos. And finally, like how, obviously, because when you use such kind of hardware boards, you will face a couple of problems. Your board might not boot up, or you have some errors. So how to solve those errors? OK, so I'll just give a small overview of this board. So as you can see that over here is your processor. It has a 1 gigahertz dual core processor. Uh, it is a package on package. So beneath, on top of this processor, you have the 1 GB of RAM. Then you, you can play uh, 1080p full HD videos on it. It also has a GPU that clocks at 304 megahertz. Uh, it also has an inbuilt digital signal processor. Then uh, you have a Wi-Fi Bluetooth. Then you, can, you have the HDMI ports. You also have the audio in and out uh, connections. Then uh, you also have an external connection, such as you have the camera connector. You have the serial port. 
Then you also have the expansion headers over here. So if you want to collect, uh, connect to some kind of external LCD, you can do that using the LCD expansion header. And you have the normal expansion header. And you also have the GPIO, this is general purpose input output pins. You have to extend them. They're not in, by default there. And you also have the serial port over there that I'm not using it right now, but the serial port you basically use to see what's going on inside the, the Panda board. I mean, sometimes what will happen is the board will not boot. So to see what the problem actually is, you will install some kind of serial uh, terminal on your computer and uh, observe what is actually going on. And if you face problems, you can post that output to the community and they'll get back to you. I have the old one, old Panda board. The new one is called Panda board ES. The only difference is that the new one has a 1.2 gigahertz processor. This one has a one gigahertz one. That's the only difference. Everything else is the same and price difference is about $25 difference. This one is for $175 and the new one is for $200. Now, I'll talk about which of the major operating systems that I've tried porting on the Panda board and which I've seen other people do it. And now, this does not mean that a particular operating system cannot be ported to a Panda board. These are just the ones I'm sure that they can be, you can run them on the Panda board, or I've seen them. Uh, you can you know, run almost majority of the versions of Ubuntu, starting from 10.04. You can run Android on it. You can run Fedora, OpenSUSE. Angstrom, Sabayan also on it. Now, uh, where to buy this? Uh, you can just go onto the Panda Board org website, and there are a lot of distributors for them. Uh, SVTronics, uh, you have Arrow, and a lot of other distributors. So you can select which one is the nearest to you, and you can order from them. So before starting your development work on the Panda board, uh, you need to buy a few accessories. So first you need an HDMI cable. Uh, then you need an external DC power supply of five volt. Uh, you need a USB hub if you want to connect more external, uh, you know, if you want to connect your keyboard or uh, mouse, because this only has by default two USB ports. What? Yeah. No, you got to buy it on your own. You only get this board, that's it. You don't get anything else. Okay, the question was, uh, if you get a power supply with the Panda board, uh, the answer is no. You only get the board. Then I would recommend that you buy an 8GB microSD card or normal SD card. Usually what happens in the 4GB microSD cards, you run out of space if you want to install further applications. So I recommend that you buy an 8GB microSD card. And you need to buy a serial to USB cables. Well, so installing Ubuntu 12.04 on Panda board, uh, well, the procedure is very long. It took me about uh, one hour or so or more for Ubuntu to install on this, so I cannot show you a live demo, but I have listed down all the steps. So first, you will need to go to uh, the Ubuntu website and download their latest release. And the, re the reason I recommend using the latest version is that they have solved a lot of bugs. Uh, I tried running 11.04 first, but I could not get it to do so, so that's why I shifted to 12.04. Then you need to download the Texas Instruments OMAP 4. Now this is based on the Texas Instrument OMAP platform. Now there are different versions, like the Beagle board is based on OMAP 3. This is OMAP 4. So you need to install the OMAP 4 version. Then you need to insert your SD card and make sure that it's not mounted. Uh, then you need to navigate to the uh, the folder or the directory where you downloaded the ISO image. Uh, then uh, you just need to type the following code. What, what this code will basically do is that it will develop all the file system for you or make prepare the SD card for booting on the Panda board. That's what this does. Because when you download the image, it's kind of compressed. So you need to unpack it and install all the file system, everything on the Panda board. So this is what this command over here does. And before booting on the, booting the Panda board, you have to install Minicom for the first time in case you get some errors or there are some problems. To know that, you have to install Minicom. But that is where you will see, OK, this is the error that you're getting. If you do not install Minicom, you can not know like, wh why, why it's not booting up or what's the problem. And then you just need to connect the SD card and the other accessories that I have connected over here and just boot up the Panda board. And the installation for Ubuntu will be the same as you would do on your normal computer. 
And in case some of you don't know what is Ubuntu, I mean, in case you guys don't know, I have also made a video, like one hour video that covers all the topics, including how to install Windows application on Ubuntu using Wine. So these are just a few hacks that I found that increase your performance a little bit. I'm not saying it increases your performance like 100% or 200%, but some of them really did increase my performance. First of all, in Ubuntu, there's a system called Swap system. So what this is, basically, this is kind of like your virtual RAM. So in case uh, there's not enough space on the RAM to store your temporary files, it uses the Swap file system. So what it does is that it uses your hard disk and creates uh, a separate allocation where it stores your temporary files in case the RAM is full. Now, in, Uba in Panda board, you have everything on your SD card. And accessing the SD card is very slow. So on top of it, if you have swap, it'll be further slow. So you got to disable the swap file. Then there's a file system called TMPFS file system. So what this does is that the most commonly accessed documents or your temporary file systems are stored on your RAM. Instead of accessing from your SD card, the most commonly documents that you access will be stored on the RAM. So the thing is that you'll get more faster access compared to accessing from your SD card. So that is the second hack you can do. Then, now the Ubuntu 12.04 comes with the default Unity interface. Uh, now the problem with this interface is that it's very heavy on the Panda board. Uh, it's a little bit laggy. So if you want more speed or more power, then I recommend that you install XUbuntu or any other lightweight desktop environment that you find comfortable with. Oh, and sometimes when you do very intensive applications, your Panda board might heat up. So you might want to use a laptop cooler or a heat sink on top of the processor. So now I'll talk about what is OpenCV. So basically, I'm sure most of you know a lot of uh, tools like MATLAB or Scilab and other tools. So basically, OpenCV is similar to that, and it's used for image processing tasks. And it actually grew out of an Intel research initiative. And the main fundamental design, uh, behind designing this was that you don't have to develop everything from scratch. If I want to detect your face, let's say I have a video camera that's doing live video recording, and I want to detect the faces inside it. I don't want to develop the whole code from scratch. So OpenCV has a lot of classifiers or machine learning algorithms. So what you can do is, as long as you know what's, how the algorithm works, you can just use the function ready madly. So let's say you want to use a function to convert a normal image to black and white. You can just use a ready made function, grayscale uh, function, to do that. You don't need to design the whole function. So that is what uh, I, I recommend using OpenCV for. And there are a lot of softwares like MATLAB, but they are very intensive. I mean, they require a lot of space for installation, and they're not free. This is completely free. And the development community behind it is very active. You have a lot of tutorials, you have a lot of code, you have a lot of example codes. There are a lot of books on this too, which you can read and figure out how to, how to use OpenCV. And uh, you can use it for a lot of other applications. I use it basically for image processing, but you can use it for some other purposes too. Now, installing OpenCV uh, 2.4, uh, this is where most of the people have problems. Um, you have to follow um, specific steps to install it, otherwise you'll have some problems. So I'm sure like a lot of, a lot of you will not be able to read this, but I'll provide the slides and everything. And I have made the presentation using Sozi. It's uh, another uh, edition you can add to Inkscape. So what happens is that instead of the normal boring presentation where you just go left and right in Word or Open Office, this one actually lets you zoom in, zoom out, depending on what kind of and you can also add further cool effects. I'm just using the zooming feature right now. Oh, for the presentation? Sozi, S-O-Z-I. And you need to use it with something else. It's not a standalone package. Okay. So first, you need to install all the prerequisites. Uh, these are the, like uh, for, to uh, do processing on the video or the image. You need some prerequisite libraries. So this over here, I have read a lot of blogs, and I have collected a list of all the possi possible prerequisites you will require to install this. And um, you first, so you will first install all of the prerequisites. Then you will download the OpenCV 2.4 from the uh, SourceForge. 
Now, there's already a pre-compiled package in Ubuntu. You can install that way, but I recommend this method so that you will get the most latest version. In the repositories, what happens is that the version is quite old sometimes. It's not the latest one. That's why I prefer this method. And over here, you can also customize. So once you downloaded that, you need to extract it to your home uh, directory. Then using your terminal, you need to navigate to the directory. And all you need to do is uh, type make, uh, you know, you need to make another directory called build in which you'll be doing all this. And then just type cmake GUI. So this will install, open up a graphical interface where you can select the components uh, which you want to be installed along with OpenCV. And after that, all you do is make. And then to make the installation permanent, you just use sudo make install. And then you just have to configure uh, your uh, local paths and everything so that you can use this library. And if you follow this method, you can also use OpenCV with Python. So as I've said over here, uh, if you follow this method, you log into your Python command prompt and you just write import CV. This will import the entire OpenCV library to Python. So you can use uh, this library with your normal Python programming. I'm just going a bit fast because I want to show you live demos of six experiments, so that'll also take a lot of time. So this is just a few screenshots. Uh, this is Xubuntu upgrading on my Panda board. And this is my setup that I had. Uh, you can see over here I have the laptop cooler because in India it used to get a lot hot. I mean. And so now the thing is, you, you're booting Panda board. I mean, you, you're doing something on the Panda board. You're running operating systems on it. But you want to do something to your external environment. You want to, uh, let's say, control a robot, or you want to you know, change something. You want to turn on and off a light or something. So to use, do something like that, you need to access the general purpose input output pins on the Panda board, which is not an easy task. So for that reason, you have the Arduino. And I'm sure most of you must know about this. So those, for those of you who don't know about Arduino, it's one of the world's most popular microcontroller development board. So usually what happens in a microcontroller is that you have to develop your own development board. You just get the chip. If you buy an Atmega 16 chip, you have to develop your own development board. You need an external programmer to dump your code that you wrote on the computer to the microcontroller. But with the Arduino, you have a USB port. So the entire code is dumped to the microcontroller using USB. And the ID that you use is the Arduino IDD that is based on processing language. And it's very simple. And I've seen people from fifth grade or fourth grade you know, even make programs on Arduino. It's very simple. And the other benefit is that they have something called a playground. OK, so they are, wait a second. I think sure. OK, see it. So, why, so they have something called the Arduino Playground, where they have tons of codes, examples, tutorials, guides that you can just follow and get your you know, code running. And I have the Arduino Mega over here. It's, it has the Atmega 128 chip. It has 54 digital pins, and blah, blah, blah. These are all just uh, uh, specs of that. And it's pretty cheap. I mean, you can get the Arduino Uno for about, like, if I'm sure, $25 max to max. And the Mega one should cost you make close to $60. And, oh, yeah. And the other thing is that the best thing about Arduino is that it has shields. So let's say you want to connect internet on your Arduino. So you just buy an Ethernet shield. So what this shield is that it plugs on top of your Arduino. So let's say you want to uh, make a call, make a, cell, make, make a call a cell phone from your Arduino. So what you do is you buy the GSM shield. So you just plug the GSM shield on top of your Arduino, and then you have that feature. So depending on what kind of feature you want on the Arduino, you can just buy that shield. They have shields for controlling motors. They have shields for controlling robots, you know, different, different shields. So you can just buy the shield that you want, depending on your need. OK, so I'll switch, switch over to the live demo part. Yeah, it, this entire, this is Ubuntu 12.04, the latest version, and it's running on the Panda board. And I don't have internet, but you can, I mean, it's pretty, I mean, it's not that fast as the computer, but it's, it's quite fast. I mean, you can do your normal browsing, or you can, I even tried playing full HD videos on it. It works great. 
And it's, it, this weighs about only like max to max 100 grams. These are just a few experiments that I made. So the experiments are first, I w the first experiment is to display uh, an image using OpenCV just to open the image and see it. The second experiment is to convert the normal image that you have to grayscale that is black and white. Then uh, how to draw a circle on a given image. The fourth experiment is a canny filter. So what this does is that it detects the edges or the boundaries. So if you have a book, it will detect the edges. Then the fifth experiment is to detect faces if you have any given image. You want to detect only the face part in it, how you do that. And the last one is I'll give you a live demo how to set up a burglar alarm system. So what I have in that experiment, I'll just go over that when I come to that. So I'm using Python because it's very easy. I mean compared to other C, C++ programming? Oh, I didn't see it, I'm sorry. OK. Let's go to a second. It's pretty fast. So I mean, do you want me to do that again? OK. So first you have the normal image, and then it converts to black and white. So you can see that I'm running an uh, image processing library, and the output is pretty fast. I mean, it's not slow. I mean, it's reasonable. So it, it draws a circle around that. So you can see that it detects all the, you know, all the edges over here, this edge. Everything, it detects the edges, I mean. And uh, to make it more precise, you have to tune it. Uh, this is just the default configuration that I've used. You can change the parameters in that to further tune it, depending upon your need. So this is the image that has all the faces, and then so what OpenCV has, it has a lot of hard classifiers. So what this means is that I'm using a pre-made hard classifier. So there were, oh, what Intel did, it did five years of further intensive research, and then it, after doing a lot of computations, it came up with the hard classifier. So what this does is that it gives you a pre-definite classifier. You just need to know how to use it and how it works. So after that, you can use any image, detect faces on it. You can use it for, uh, I'm doing static processing. So I'm, having, I'm using a pre-image pre that I have. You can connect your camera to the Panda board and take a live video and do the same operation that I'm doing over here and detect faces. So what I, in the final experiment, what I'm doing is that uh, I have the Panda board running the face detect program that I showed you earlier. Uh, so what I'm doing over here is that it will detect faces. And even if I have a live camera, this will do the same operation. But I don't have a camera. That's a problem. So if you have a live camera attached to your Panda board, it will uh, take the live video and process it and detect faces. Now, if any face is detected, let's say you are leaving your home at 8 o'clock and you turn on the system. So after that time, when you're out, if someone comes into your home, that means it's a bulk group. Uh, someone is trying to break in your home. So if the match is positive, it detects faces, then what it'll do is I have the Arduino connected to the USB port. It will trigger the Arduino. And as of now, I did not have the buzzer or you know, something to control. So I'm just going to use an LED. So the LED stands for anything you can use. You can use a, 
a full fledged buzzer on this also that can, you know, maybe alert a security warning and maybe alert your neighbors. So what this final program is going to do is that if the face detection is positive, it will turn on the LED. If it's not, then it will not turn on the LED. So if you see the code, I mean, it's pretty simple. I mean, the functions are in Arduino are pre-built. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Like, you basically have two loops, uh, the setup loop and the normal loop that you have. Now, this loop only runs one time, and the other loop, this loop, uh, runs infinite times. And you, you basically do your programming inside two of these loops. That's it. And as you can see, it's pretty simple if you want to do microcontroller programming. Wait, uh, yeah. Clear, I understand. You're actually running the Arduino programming uh, framework on, on the Panda board. Panda yes. Yeah. And then the, the code on the Arduino is just listening over the serial port for commands. Yeah, so command from, from uh, the, the yeah from the Panda board. Yes. Because the limitation with Arduino is that it can do a lot of stuff. It can, uh, you know, interact with your environment. Okay, the question was that: uh, Am I running the Arduino uh, with the Panda board? Yes. Uh, so the system setup is that the Arduino is connected to the Panda board, and the reason for doing is because the Arduino has some limitations. It can do a lot of changes to the environment. You can control a lot of stuff, but it cannot do processing because it's a microcontroller. You can do it, but it's very difficult. So using the good points of the Panda board that is a lot of processing power. I'm trying to combine both of them. So I've uploaded the code. I think it should turn on the LED if everything is right. I'll just put it over here. Did you see that LED blink once? So the moment it detected, that, okay, fine, the faces was there. It triggered the Arduino and turned on the LED. And if you had some other system buzzer or your security system attached to this, it will also do the same thing that I'm doing over here. This is just an example. Okay, I'll just switch over now. Now, often while working on the Panda board, you'll have a lot of problems. Uh, the board might not boot up or you might not get something. But I recommend that you join the Panda board Google group. Uh, they, they have a lot of users. And usually when I used to post my queries and everything, they would reply back within a day or so usually. Or sometimes what happens is someone already had the same problem. So you can just search the forums. And I'm pretty much sure if you're starting now, there must be someone who had the same problems. So you can just look what solutions they used. And yeah, the second option is Google, because a lot of people write blogs and everything on Panda board and everything. They write all the steps you can follow. So probably you will find a blog that matches your work that you want to do. And now my further research work is to, uh, everyone knows about the Microsoft Kinect. And a lot of people, I've seen a lot of cool you know, hacks and programs that people have done with the Kinect. There's actually a program where uh, a person uh, has made that using Kinect, it's ha able to help the blind person navigate anywhere. Uh, it has a Bluetooth and everything. So using Kinect, you get the 3D data. Uh, and using that, you can do image processing on that and reproduce to get some good results. But the problem is that they're doing it on a laptop. So the person who made the system had an entire laptop on his back. So he had to walk with the laptop. And laptop is very heavy. So I'm trying to get the Kinect to work on the Panda board so anyone can just put it in a bag and just walk it with them. 
and also looking at the fact that cloud computing is very much growing. So I'm trying to also figure out a way how to use cloud computing with the Panda board. So what will happen is instead of me doing all the image processing on the Panda board, I can just have uh, my Panda board connect to a cloud somewhere which I set up. So that does all the processing, and it just sends a command like I do to the Arduino. It just sends a final command, yes or no. And depending on that, the Panda board can take some actions. That is what my future work is. And uh, uh, you can contact me at janiel.dalal at gmail.com. And I would really like to thank the self team for accepting my talk and also the Panda board community for helping me. And now if you have any questions regarding this, your personal questions, if you, if you have some idea that you want to know if it's possible using the Panda board, I can tell you if it's not, or if it's a good platform or yes. Well, it, it has a GPIO pin, so you have to use the hookup wires and use an external. OK, so the question was, does it have a GPIO pins on the Panda board? So yeah, it does have that. But the thing is, they are connected with the SD card slot. So you have to use hookup wires and put it, the hookup wire connector over there to the breadboard to do some ex whatever work you want to do. So looking at that option and looking at the Arduino, I think Arduino is a much easier option, I mean. And you can do much more with the Arduino than normal. I'm sure you've heard of the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Well, the thing with uh, Raspberry Pi is that it has only, OK, the question was, oh, I'm really sorry for that. The question was, is Raspberry Pi a replacement for Panda board and maybe Arduino? Well, for Arduino, yeah, because it's way powerful than Arduino. Um, but not for all applications. And the second thing is, the Raspberry Pi has, uh, if I'm correct, 700 megahertz processor. And this one has 1 gigahertz. And the RAM is also twice on this. You have more USB ports. Uh, you have, basically, this is more feature, and this is more expensive. So for certain applications, it's a good, I mean, to start, it's a good way. Because uh, you don't want to start directly on the Panda board. Because just a minute, uh, if, if you do something bad or if you blow up the Panda board, I mean, that's $200 down the drain. You don't want to do that. You don't start with the Raspberry Pi. So even if you do something bad to it, it's only $35 or $20. That's a wasted. But eventually, you will need a further powerful platform. For that, you might want to move to the Panda board. Yes, sir? OK, the question is that the Raspberry Pi only has the GPIO pins. It does not have the pulse width modulation pins and the analog to digital converter and those kind of uh, peripherals. Well, so what I would recommend is that um, you, I, I think I read a blog where someone has done something like that on an ARM-based board, but it's very hard. I mean, you have to spend a lot of time to figure out how to do it. So I, my, salute, my advice would be to just hook up an Arduino with it, so it becomes much easier. And as you can see, the system is very compact. I mean, uh, does anyone else have any questions? Like, yes? Uh, it can play your full HD videos. OK, the question is, what is the graphic capabilities of the Panda board? Well, they're decent enough that you can run a Blu-ray movie or a full HD video on it. Without any lag, I mean. Yes. Pardon me. Uh, the quick. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not able to. I'm not heard about that. I don't know. That. Oh, oh yeah. If it's uh, okay, the question is that if you want to run a particular desktop application on Panda board that you, you may be using on your home Linux system, well, yeah. If you're running Ubuntu on it and you have a certain application that you're running on your home Ubuntu computer, well, yeah, it'll work on the Panda board mostly. Yes, sir? OK, the question is that uh, does the OpenCV use the the TI graphic processor that comes with it, or does it use a native ARM code? Well, 
it depends on how you want to use it. I mean, if you want, you can use uh, the graphic module that comes with it. But as far as I'm sure, uh, I don't think there's a dedicated uh, graphic library f to use the, the, the TI processor that comes with the Panda board. There have been libraries to use your NVIDIA. If you have an NVIDIA graphic card on your laptop, then there is uh, an, a special NVIDIA library for OpenCV. I forgot the name, but uh, it's very popular. So you can use it for that. I have not enabled the, the graphic module on the Panda board, because what I heard is that the, from the recent updates on the Panda board, I would recommend you don't install that update, because then the system does not respond that well with the graphic drivers, the recent ones. I'm just using the native one. Any questions or else? OK, guys, thanks a lot for attending my talk. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. 
the, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how Cloud Stack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of Cloud Stack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.